Part One of The Men of Zanzibar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn. The Men of Zanzibar by Richard Harding Davis. Part One when his hunting trip in uganda was over hemingway shipped his specimens and weapons direct from mombasa to new york but he himself journeyed south over the few miles that stretched to zanzibar on the outward trip the steamer had touched there and the little he saw of the place had so charmed him that all the time he was on safari he promised himself he would not return home without revisiting it on the morning he arrived he had called upon harris his consul to inquire about the hotel and that evening harris had returned his call and introduced him at the club one of the men there asked hemingway what brought him to africa and when he answered simply and truthfully that he had come to shoot big game it was as though he had said something clever and every one smiled on the way back to the hotel as they felt their way through the narrow slits in the wall that served as streets he asked the consul why every one had smiled the consul laughed evasively it's a local joke he explained a lot of men come here for reasons best kept to themselves and they all say what you said that they've come to shoot big game it's grown to be a polite way of telling a man it's none of his business but i didn't mean it that way protested hemingway i really have been after big game for the last eight months in the tone one uses to quiet a drunken man or a child the consul answered soothingly of course he assented of course you have but to show he was not hopelessly credulous and to keep hemingway from involving himself deeper he hinted tactfully maybe they noticed you came ashore with only one steamer trunk and no gun cases oh that's easily explained laughed hemingway my heavy luggage the consul had reached his house and his boy was pounding upon it with his heavy staff please don't explain to me he begged it's quite unnecessary down here we are so darned glad to see any white man that we don't ask anything of him except that he won't hurry away we judge them as they behave themselves here we don't care what they are at home or why they left it hemingway was highly amused to find that he a respectable sport-loving hemingway of massachusetts should be mistaken for a gun-runner slave-dealer or escaping cashier greatly delighted him all right he exclaimed i'll promise not to bore you with my past and i agree to be judged by zanzibar standards i only hope i can live up to them for i see i am going to like the place very much hemingway kept his promise he bored no one with confidences as to his ancestors of his past he made a point never to speak he preferred that the little community into which he had dropped should remain unenlightened should take him as they found him of the fact that a college was named after his grandfather and that on his father's railroad he could travel through many states he was discreetly silent the men of zanzibar asked no questions that hemingway could play a stiff game of tennis a stiffer game of poker and on the piano songs from home was to them sufficient recommendation in a week he had become one of the most popular members of zanzibar society it was as though he had lived there always 
Hemingway found himself reaching out to grasp the warmth of the place as a flower turns to the sun. He discovered that for thirty years something in him had been cheated. For thirty years he had believed that completely to satisfy his soul all he needed was the grey stone walls and the grey shingled cabins under the grey skies of new england that what in nature he most loved was the pine forests and the fields of goldenrod on the rock-bound coast of the north shore but now like a man escaped from prison he leaped and danced in the glaring sunlight of the equator he revelled in the reckless generosity of nature in the glorious confusion of colours in the blooming blue of the indian ocean in the arabian nights spent upon the housetops under the purple sky and beneath silver stars so near that he could touch them with his hand he found it like being perpetually in a comic opera and playing a part in one for only the cynic artist would dare to paint houses in such yellow pink and cobalt blue only a producer who had never ventured farther from broadway than the atlantic city broadwalk would have conceived costumes so mad and so magnificent instinctively he cast the people of zanzibar in the conventional rules of musical comedy his choruses were already in waiting there was the sultan's bodyguard in gold-laced turbans the merchants of the bazaars in red fezes and gowns of flowing silk the malay sailors in blue the black native police in scarlet the ladies of the harems closely veiled and cloaked the market women in a single garment of orange or scarlet or purple or of all three and the happy hilarious zanzibari boys in the colour god gave them for hours he would sit under the yellow and green awning of the greek hotel and watch the procession pass or he would lie under an umbrella on the beach and laugh as the boatmen lifted their passengers to their shoulders and with them splash through the breakers or in the bazaars for hours he would bargain with the indian merchants or in the great mahogany hall of the ivory house to the whisper of a punka and the tinkle of ice in a tall glass listen to tales of arab raids of elephant poachers of the trade in white and black ivory of the great explorers who had sat in that same room of emin pasha of livingstone of stanley his comic opera lacked only a heroine and the love interest when he met mrs adair he found both polly adair as every one who dared to do so preferred to call her was like himself an american and though absurdly young a widow in the states she would have been called an extremely pretty girl in a community where the few dozen white women had wilted and faded in the fierce sun of the equator and where the rest of the women were jet black except their teeth which were dyed in an alluring purple polly adair was as beautiful as a june morning at least so hemingway thought the first time he saw her and each succeeding time he thought her more beautiful more lovely more to be loved he met her three days after his arrival at the residence of the british agent and consul general where lady firth was giving tea to the six nurses from the english hospital and to all the other respectable members of zanzibar society my husband's typist said her ladyship as she helped hemingway to tea 
is a compatriot of yours she's such a nice girl not a bit like an american i don't know what i'd do in this awful place without her promise me she begged tragically you will not ask her to marry you unconscious of his fate hemingway promised because all the men do sighed lady firth and i never know what morning one of the wretches won't carry her off to a home of her own and then what would become of me men are so selfish if you must fall in love suggested her ladyship promise me you will fall in love with she paused innocently and raised baby blue eyes in a baby-like stare with some one else again hemingway promised he bowed gallantly that will be quite easy he said her ladyship smiled but hemingway did not see the smile he was looking past her at a girl from home who had come across the terrace carrying in her hand a stenographer's notebook lady firth followed the direction of his eyes and saw the look in them she exclaimed with dismay already already he deserts me even before the ink is dry on the paper she drew the notebook from mrs adair's fingers and dropped it under the tea-table let us must wait my child she declared but sir george protested the girl sir george must wait too continued his wife the foreign office must wait the british empire must wait until you have had your tea the girl laughed helplessly as though assured her fellow-countryman would comprehend she turned to him they're so exactly like what you want them to be she said i mean about their tea hemingway smiled back with such intimate understanding that lady firth glanced up inquiringly have you met mrs adair already she asked no said hemingway but i've been trying to meet her for thirty years perplexed the englishwoman frowned and then with delight at her own perspicuity laughed aloud i know she cried in your country you are what they call a hustler is that right she waved them away take mrs adair over there she commanded and tell her all the news from home tell her about the railroad accidents and washouts and the latest thing in lynching the young people stretched out in long wicker chairs in the shade of a tree covered with purple flowers on a perch at one side of them an orangutan in a steel belt was combing the whiskers of her infant daughter at their feet what looked like two chow puppies but which happened to be lady firth's pet lions were chewing each other's toothless gums and in the immediate foreground the hospital nurses were defying the sun at tennis while the sultan's band played selections from a gaiety success of many years in the past with these surroundings it was difficult to talk of home nor on any later occasions except through inadvertence did they talk of home for the reasons already stated it amused hemingway to volunteer no confidences on account of what that same evening harris told him of mrs adair he asked none harris himself was a young man in no way inclined to withhold confidences he enjoyed giving out information he enjoyed talking about himself his duties the other consuls the zanzibaris and his native state of iowa so long as he was permitted to talk the listener could select the subject 
but combined with his loquacity hemingway had found him kind-hearted intelligent observing and the call of a common country had got them quickly together hemingway was quite conscious that the girl he had seen but once had impressed him out of all proportion to what he knew of her she seemed too good to be true and he tried to persuade himself that after eight months in the hinterland among hippos and zebras any reasonably attractive girl would have proved equally disturbing but he was not convinced he did not wish to be convinced he assured himself that had he met mrs adair at home among hundreds of others he would have recognized her as a woman of exceptional character as one especially charming he wanted to justify this idea of her he wanted to talk of mrs adair to harris not to learn more concerning her but just for the pleasure of speaking her name he was much upset at that at the discovery that on meeting a woman for the first time he still could be so boyishly and ingenuously moved greatly pleased him it was a most delightful secret so he acted on the principle that when a man immensely admires a woman and wishes to conceal that fact from every one else he can best do so by declaring his admiration in the frankest and most open manner after the tea-party as harris and himself sat in the consulate he so expressed himself what an extraordinary nice girl he exclaimed is that mrs adair i had a long talk with her she is most charming however did a woman like that come to be in a place like this judging from his manner it seemed to hemingway that at the mention of mrs adair's name he had found harris mentally on guard as though the consul had guessed the question would come and had prepared for it she just dropped in here one day said harris from no place in particular personally i always have thought from heaven it is a good address said hemingway it seems to suit her the consul agreed anyway if she doesn't come from there that's where she's going just on account of the good she's done us while she's been here she arrived four months ago with a typewriting machine and letters to me from our consul in cape town and durban she had done some typewriting for them it seems that after her husband died which was a few months after they were married she learned to make her living by typewriting she worked too hard and broke down and the doctor said she must go to hot countries the hotter the better so she's worked her way half around the world typewriting she worked chiefly for her own consuls or for the american commission houses sometimes she stayed a month sometimes only over one steamer day but when she got here lady firth took such a fancy to her that she made sir george engaged her as his private secretary and she's been here ever since in a community so small as that of zanzibar the white residents saw one another every day and within a week hemingway had met mrs adair many times he met her at dinner at the british agency he met her in the country club where the white exiles gathered for tea and tennis he hired a launch and in her honour gave a picnic on the north coast of the island and on three glorious and memorable nights after different dinner parties had ascended to the roof he sat at her side and across the white level of the housetops looked down into the moonlit harbour what interest the two young people felt in each other was in no way discouraged by their surroundings in the tropics the tender emotions are not winter-killed 
had they met at home the conventions his own work her social duties would have kept the progress of their interest within a certain speed limit but they were in a place free of conventions and the preceding eight months which hemingway had spent in the jungle and on the plain had made the society of his fellow-man and of mrs adair in particular especially attractive hemingway had no work to occupy his time and he placed it unreservedly at the disposition of his countrywoman in doing so it could not be said that mrs adair encouraged him hemingway himself would have been the first to acknowledge this from the day he met her he was conscious that always there was an intangible barrier between them even before she possibly could have guessed that his interest in her was more than even she attractive as she was had the right to expect she had wrapped around herself an invisible mantle of defence there were certain speeches of his which she never heard certain tones to which she never responded at moments when he was complimenting himself that at last she was content to be in his company she would suddenly rise and join the others and he would be left wondering in what way he could possibly have offended he assured himself that a woman young and attractive in a strange land in her dependent position must of necessity be discreet but in his conduct there certainly had been nothing that was not considerate courteous and straightforward when he appreciated that he cared for her seriously that he was gloriously happy in caring and proud of the way in which he cared the fact that she persistently held him at arm's length puzzled and hurt at first when he had deliberately set to work to make her like him he was glad to think that owing to his reticence about himself if she did like him it would be for himself alone and not for his worldly goods but when he knew her better he understood that if once mrs adair made up her mind to take a second husband the fact that he was a social and financial somebody and not as many in zanzibar supposed hemingway to be a social outcast would make but little difference nor was her manner to be explained by the fact that the majority of women found him unattractive as to that the pleasant burden of his experience was to the contrary he at last wondered if there was some one else if he had come into her life too late he set about looking for the man and so he believed he soon found him End of part one. Part two of The Men of Zanzibar by Richard Harding Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Part two. Of the little colony, Arthur Fearing was the man of whom Hemingway had seen the least that was so because fearing wished it like himself fearing was an american young and a bachelor but very much unlike hemingway a hermit and a recluse two years before he had come to zanzibar looking for an investment for his money in zanzibar there were gentlemen adventurers of every country who were welcome to live in any country save their own to them mr fearing seemed a heaven-sent victim but to him their alluring tales of the fortunes that were to rise from buried treasures lost mines and pearl beds did not appeal instead he conferred with the consuls the responsible merchants the partners in the prosperous trading-houses 
after a month of looking around he had purchased outright the goodwill and stock of one of the oldest of the commission houses and soon showed himself to be a most capable man of business but except as a man of business no one knew him from the dim recesses of his warehouse he passed each day to the seclusion of his bungalow in the country and although every one was friendly to him he made no friends it was only after the arrival of mrs adair that he consented to show himself and it was soon noticed that it was only when she was invited that he would appear and that on these occasions he devoted himself entirely to her in the presence of others he was still shy gravely polite and speaking but little and never of himself but with mrs adair his shyness seemed to leave him and when with her he was seen to talk easily and eagerly and on her part to what he said polly adair listened with serious interest lady firth who at home was a trained and successful matchmaker and who in zanzibar had found but a limited field for her activities decided that if her companion and protege must marry she should marry fearing fearing was no gentleman adventurer remittance man or humble clerk serving his apprenticeship to a steamship line or an ivory house he was one of the pillars of zanzibar society the trading-house he had purchased had had its beginning in the slave trade and now under his alert direction was making a turnover equal to that of any of its ancient rivals personally fearing was a most desirable catch he was well-mannered well-read of good appearance steady and in a latitude only six degrees removed from the equator of impeccable morals it is said that it is the person who is in love who always is the first to discover his successful rival it is either an instinct or because his concern is deeper than that of others and so when hemingway sought for the influence that separated him from polly adair the trail led to fearing to find that the obstacle in the path of his true love was a man greatly relieved him he had feared that what was in the thoughts of mrs adair was the memory of her dead husband he had no desire to cross swords with a ghost but to a living rival he could afford to be generous for he was sure no one could care for polly adair as he cared and like every other man in love he believed that he alone had discovered in her beauties of soul and character that to the rest of mankind were hidden this knowledge he assured himself had aroused in him a depth of devotion no one else could hope to imitate and this depth of devotion would in time so impress her would become so necessary to her existence that it would force her at last into the arms of the only man who could offer it having satisfied himself in this fashion he continued cheerfully on his way and the presence of a rival in no way discouraged him it only was polly adair who discouraged him and this in spite of the fact that every hour of the day he tried to bring himself pleasantly to her notice all that an idle young man had in love aided and abetted by imagination and an unlimited letter of credit could do hemingway did but to no end 
the treasures he dug out from the bazaars and presented to her under false pretenses as trinkets he happened at that moment to find in his pockets were admired by her at their own great value and returned also under false pretenses as having been offered her only to examine it is for your sister at home i suppose she prompted it is quite lovely thank you for letting me see it after having been several times severely snubbed in this fashion hemingway remarked grimly as he put a black pearl back into his pocket at this rate sister will be mighty glad to see me when i get home it seems almost a pity i haven't got a sister the girl answered this only with a grave smile on another occasion she admired a polo pony that had been imported for the stable of the boy sultan but next morning hemingway after much diplomacy became the owner of it and proudly rode it to the agency lady firth and polly adair walked out to meet him arm and arm but at sight of the pony there came into the eyes of the secretary a look that caused hemingway to wish himself and his mounts many miles into the jungle he saw that before it had been proffered his gift horse had been rejected he acted promptly lady firth he said you've been so awfully kind to me made this place so like a home to me that i want you to put this mare in your stable the sultan wanted her but when he learned i meant to turn her over to you he let her go we both hope you'll accept lady firth had no scruples in five minutes she had accepted had clapped a side saddle on her rich girt and was cantering joyously down the pearl road polly adair looked after her with an expression that was distinctly wistful thus encouraged hemingway said i am glad you are sorry i hope every time you see that pony you'll be sorry why should i be sorry asked the girl because you have been unkind said hemingway and it is not your character to be unkind and that you have shown lack of character ought to make you sorry but you know perfectly well said mrs adair that if i were to take any of these wonderful things you bring me i wouldn't have any character left she smiled at him reassuringly and you know she added that that is not why i do not take them it isn't because i can't afford to or because i don't want them because i do but it's because i don't deserve them because i can give you nothing in return as the copy-book says returned hemingway the pleasure is in the giving if the copy-book don't say that i do and to pretend that you give me nothing that is ridiculous it was so ridiculous that he rushed on vehemently why every minute you give me something he exclaimed just to see you just to know you are alive just to be certain when i turn in at night that when the world wakes up again you will still be a part of it that is what you give me and its name is happiness he had begun quite innocently he had had no idea that it would come but he had said it as clearly as though he had dropped upon the knee laid his hand over his heart and exclaimed most beautiful of your sex i love you will you marry me his eyes and the tone of his voice had said it and he knew that he had said it and that she knew her eyes were filled with sudden tears and so wonderful was the light in them that for one mad moment hemingway thought they were tears of happiness 
but the light died and what had been tears became only wet drops of water and he saw to his dismay that she was most miserable the girl moved ahead of him to the cliff on which the agency stood and which overhung the harbour and the indian ocean her eyes were filled with trouble as she raised them to his they begged of him to be kind i am glad you told me she said i have been afraid it was coming but until you told me i could not say anything i tried to stop you i was rude and unkind you certainly were hemingway agreed cheerfully and the more you would have nothing to do with me the more i admired you and then i learned to admire you more and then to love you it seems now as though i had always known and always loved you and now this is what we are going to do he wouldn't let her speak he rushed on precipitately we are first going up to the house to get your typewriting machine and we will bring it back here and hurl it as far as we can off this cliff i want to see the splash i want to hear it smash when it hits that rock it has been my worst enemy because it helped you to be independent of me because it kept you from me time after time on the veranda when i was pretending to listen to lady firth i was listening to that damned machine banging and complaining and tiring your pretty fingers and your dear eyes so first it has got to go you have been its slave now i am going to be your slave you have only to rub the lamp and things will happen and because i've told you nothing about myself you mustn't think that the money that helps to make them happen is tainted it isn't nor am i nor my father nor my father's father i am asking you to marry as a perfectly respectable young man and when you do again he gave her no opportunity to interrupt but rushed on impetuously we will sail away across that ocean to wherever you will take me to ceylon and tokyo and san francisco to naples and new york to greece and athens they are all near they are all yours will you accept them and me he smiled appealingly but most miserably for though he had spoken lightly and with confidence it was to conceal the fact that he was not at all confident as he had read in her eyes her refusal of his pony he had read even as he spoke her refusal of himself when he ceased speaking the girl answered if i say that what you tell me makes me proud i am saying too little she shook her head firmly with an air of finality that frightened hemingway but what you ask what you suggest is impossible you don't like me said hemingway i like you very much returned the girl and if i don't seem unhappy that it can't be it is because i always have known it can't be why can't it be rebelled hemingway i don't mean that i can't understand your not wanting to marry me but if i knew your objection maybe i could beat it down again with the same air of finality the girl moved her head slowly as though considering each word she began cautiously i cannot tell you the reason she said because it does not concern only myself if you mean you care for someone else pleaded hemingway that does not frighten me at all it did frighten him extremely but believing that a faint heart never won anything he pretended to be brave for you he boasted i would go down into the grave as deep as any man he that hath more let him give i know what i offer i know i love you as no other man 
the girl backed away from him as though he had struck her you must not say that she commanded for the first time he saw that she was moved that the fingers she laced and unlaced were trembling it is final exclaimed the girl i cannot marry you or any one i i have promised i am not free nothing in the world is final returned hemingway sharply except death he raised his hat and as though to leave her moved away not because he admitted defeat but because he felt that for the present to continue might lose him the chance to fight again but to deliver an ultimatum he turned back as long as you are alive and i am alive he told her all things are possible i don't give up hope i don't give up you the girl exclaimed with a gesture of despair he won't understand she cried hemingway advanced eagerly help me to understand he begged you won't understand explained the girl that i am speaking the truth you are right that things can change in the future but nothing can change the past can't you understand that what do i care for the past cried the young man scornfully i know you as well as though i had known you for a thousand years and i love you the girl flushed crimson not my past she gasped i meant i don't care what you meant said hemingway i'm not prying into your little secrets i know only one thing two things that i love you and that until you love me i am going to make your life hell he caught at her hands and for an instant she let him clasp them in both of his while she looked at him something in her face other than distress and pity caused his heart to leap but he was too wise to speak and that she might not read the hope in his eyes turned quickly and left her he had not crossed the grounds of the agency before he had made up his mind as to the reason of her repelling him she is engaged to fearing he told himself she has promised to marry fearing she thinks that it is too late to consider another man the prospect of a fight for the woman he loved thrilled him greatly his lower jaw said pugnaciously i'll show her it's not too late he promised himself i'll show her which of us is the man to make her happy and if i am not the man i'll take the first outbound steamer and trouble them no more but before that happens he also promised himself fearing must show he is the better man in spite of his brave words in spite of his determination within the day hemingway had withdrawn in favour of his rival and on the crown prince eitel bound for genoa and new york had booked his passage home on the afternoon of the same day he had spoken to polly adair hemingway at the sunset hour betook himself to the consulate at that hour it had become his custom to visit his fellow-countryman and with him share the gossip of the day and such a cocktail as only a fellow-countryman could compose later he was to dine at the house of the ivory company and as his heart never ceased telling him mrs adair was also to be present it will be a very pleasant party said harris they gave me a bid too but it's steamer day to-morrow and i've got to get my mail ready for the crown prince eitel mrs adair is to be there hemingway nodded and with pleasant anticipation waited 
of mrs adair harris always spoke with reverent enthusiasm and the man who loved her delighted to listen but this time harris disappointed him and fearing too he added again hemingway nodded the conjunction of the two names surprised him but he made no sign loquacious as he knew harris to be he never before had heard his friend even suggest the subject that to zanzibar had become of acute interest harris filled the two glasses and began to pace the room when he spoke it was in the aggrieved tone of one who feels himself placed in a false position there's no one he complained suddenly so popularly unpopular as the man who butts in i know that but still i've always taken his side i've always been for him he halted straddling with legs apart and hands deep in his trousers pockets and frowned down upon his guest suppose he began aggressively i see a man driving his car over a cliff if i tell him that road will take him over a cliff the worst that can happen to me is to be told to mind my own business and i can always answer back i was only trying to help you if i don't speak the man breaks his neck between the two it seems to me sooner than have any one's life on my hands i'd rather be told to mind my own business hemingway stared into his glass his expression was distinctly disapproving but undismayed the consul continued now we all know that this morning you gave that polo pony to lady firth and one of us guesses that you first offered it to some one else who refused it one of us thinks that very soon to-morrow or even to-night at this party you may offer that same person something else something worth more than a polo pony and that if she refuses that it is going to break you all up is going to hurt you for the rest of your life lifting his eyes from his glass hemingway shot at his friend a glance of warning in haste harris continued i know he protested answering the look i know that this is where mr butinsky is told to mind his own business but i'm going right on i'm going to state a hypothetical case with no names mentioned and no questions asked or answered i'm going to state a theory and let you draw your own deductions he slid into a chair and across the table fastened his eyes on those of his friend confidently and undisturbed but with a wry smile of dislike hemingway stared fixedly back at him what demanded harris is the first role in detective work hemingway started he was prepared for something unpleasant but not for that particular form of unpleasantness but his faith was unshaken and he smiled confidently he let the consul answer his own question it is to follow the woman declared harris and accordingly what should be the first precaution of a man making his getaway to see that the woman does not follow but suppose we are dealing with a fugitive of especial intelligence with a criminal who has imagination and brains he might fix it so that the woman could follow him without giving him away he might plan it so that no one could suspect she might arrive at his hiding-place only after many months only after each had made separately a long circuit of the globe only after a journey with a plausible and legitimate object she would arrive disguised in every way and they would meet as total strangers 
and as strangers under the eyes of others they would become acquainted would gradually grow more friendly would be seen more frequently together until at last people would say those two mean to make a match of it and then one day openly in the sight of all men with the aid of the law and the church they would resume those relations that existed before the man ran away and the woman followed there was a short silence hemingway broke it in a tone that would accept no denial you can't talk like that to me he cried what do you mean without resentment the consul regarded him with grave solicitude his look was one of real affection and although his tone held the absolute finality of the family physician who delivers a sentence of death he spoke with gentleness and regret i mean he said that mrs adair is not a widow that the man she speaks of as her late husband is not dead that that man is fearing hemingway felt afraid a month before a rhinoceros had charged him and had dropped at his feet at another time a wounded lioness had leaped into his path and crouched to spring then he had not been afraid then he had aimed as confidently as though he were firing at a straw target but now he felt real fear fear of something he did not comprehend of a situation he could not master of an adversary as strong as fate by a word something had been snatched from him that he now knew was as dear to him as life that was life that was what made it worth continuing and he could do nothing to prevent it he could not help himself he was as impotent as the prisoner who hears the judge banish him into exile he tried to adjust his mind to the calamity but his mind refused as easily as with his finger a man can block the swing of a pendulum and halt the progress of the clock harris with a word had brought the entire world to a full stop and then above his head hemingway had heard the lazy whisper of the punkah and from the harbour the raucous whistle of the crown prince eitel signalling her entrance the world had not stopped for the punker boy and the captain of the german steamer for harris seated with face averted the world was still going gaily and busily forward only for him had it stopped End of part two. Part three of the Men of Zanzibar by Richard Harding Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Part three. In spite of the confident tone in which Harris had spoken, in spite of the fact that unless he knew it was the truth, he would not have spoken, Hemingway tried to urge himself to believe there had been some hideous, absurd error but in answer came back to him snatches of talk or phrases the girl had last addressed to him you can command the future but you cannot change the past i cannot marry you or any one i am not free and then to comfort himself he called up the look he had surprised in her eyes when he stood holding her hands in his he clung to it as a drowning man will clutch even at a piece of floating seaweed when he tried to speak he found his voice choked and stifled and that his distress was evident he knew from the pity he read in the eyes of harris in a voice strange to him he heard himself saying 
why do you think that you've got to tell me i have a right to know this morning i asked mrs adair to marry me the consul exclaimed with dismay and squirmed unhappily i didn't know he protested i thought i was in time i ought to have told you days ago but tell me now commanded hemingway i know it in a thousand ways began harris hemingway raised his eyes hopefully but the consul shook his head but to convince you he went on i need tell you only one the thousand other proofs are looks they have exchanged sentences i have chanced to overhear and that each of them unknown to the other has told me of little happenings and incidents which i found were common to both each has described the house in which he or she lived and it was the same house they claim to come from different cities in new england they came from the same city they claim that's no proof cried hemingway either that they are married or that the man is a criminal for a moment harris regarded the other in silence then he said you're making it very hard for me i see i've got to show you it's kindest after all to cut quick he leaned further forward and his voice dropped speaking quickly he said last summer i lived outside the town in a bungalow on the pearl road fearing's house was next to mine this was before mrs adair went to live at the agency and while she was alone in another bungalow further down the road i was ill that summer my nerves went back on me i couldn't sleep i used to sit all night on my veranda and pray for the sun to rise from where i sat i was dark and no one could see me but i could see the veranda of fearing's house and into his garden and night after night i saw mrs adair creep out of fearing's house saw him walk with her to the gate saw him in the shadow of the bushes take her in his arms and saw them kiss the voice of the consul rose sharply no one knows that but you and i and he cried defiantly it is impossible for us to believe ill of polly adair the easy explanation we refuse it is intolerable and so you must believe as i believe that when she visited fearing by night she went to him because she had the right to go to him because already she was his wife and now when everybody here believes they met for the first time in zanzibar when no one will be surprised if they should marry they will go through the ceremony again and live as man and wife as they are as they were before they fled from america hemingway was seated with his elbows on the table and his face in his hands he was so long silent that harris struck the table roughly with his palm well he demanded why don't you speak do you doubt her don't you believe she is his wife i refuse to believe anything else said hemingway he rose and slowly and heavily moved towards the door and i will not trouble them any more he added i'll leave at sunrise on the idol harris exclaimed in dismay but hemingway did not hear him in the doorway he halted and turned back from his voice all trace of emotion had departed why he asked dully do you think fearing is a fugitive not that it matters to her since she loves him or that it matters to me only i would like to think you were wrong i want her to have only the best again the consul moved unhappily i oughtn't to tell you he protested and if i do i ought to tell the state department and a detective agency first they have the call they want him or a man damned like him his voice dropped to a whisper 
the man wanted is henry brownell a cashier of a bank in waltham massachusetts thirty-five years of age smooth-shaven college-bred speaking with a marked new england accent and with other marks that fit fearing like the cover on a book the department and the pinkertons have been devilling the life out of me about it for nine months they are positive he is on the coast of africa i put them off i wasn't sure you've been protecting them said hemingway i wasn't sure reiterated harris and if i were the pinkertons can do their own sleuthing the man's living honestly now anyway isn't he he demanded and she loves him at least she's struck by him why should i punish her his tone seemed to challenge and upbraid good god cried the other i'm not blaming you i'd be proud of the chance to do as much i asked because i'd like to go away thinking she's content thinking she's happy with him doesn't it look as though she were harris protested she's followed him followed him half around the globe if she'd been happier away from him she'd have stayed away from him so intent had been the man upon their talk that neither had noticed the passing of the minutes or what at other times was an event of moment that the mail steamer had distributed her mail and passengers and when a servant entered bearing lamps and from the office the consul's clerk appeared with a bundle of letters from the idol both were taken by surprise so late exclaimed hemingway i must go if i'm to sail with the idol at daybreak i've little time but he did not go as he advanced towards harris with his hand outstretched in adieu the face of the consul halted him with the letters the clerk had placed upon the table a visiting card and as it lay in the circle of light from the lamp the consul as though it were alive and menacing stared at it in fascination moving stiffly he turned it so that hemingway could see on it hemingway read george s shire and on a lower line representing william l pinkerton to the woman he loved the calamity they dreaded had come and hemingway with a groan of dismay exclaimed aloud it is the end from the darkness of the outer office a man stepped slowly into the circle of the lamp they could see his figure only from the waistcoat the rest of him was blurred in shadows it is the end he repeated inquiringly he spoke the phrase with peculiar emphasis as though to impress it upon the memory of the two others his voice was cool alert authoritative the end of what he demanded sharply the question was most difficult in the silence the detective moved into the light he was tall and strongly built his face was shrewd and intelligent he might have been a prosperous man of business which of you is the consul he asked but he did not take his eyes from hemingway i am the consul said harris but still the detective did not turn from hemingway why he asked did this gentleman when he read my card said it is the end the end of what has anything been going on here that came to an end when he saw my card disconcerted in deep embarrassment harris struggled for a word but his distress was not observed by the detective his eyes suspicious and accusing still were fixed upon hemingway and under their scrutiny harris saw his friend slowly retreat slowly crumple up into a chair slowly raise his hands to cover his face as though in a nightmare he heard him saying savagely 
it is the end of two years of hell it is the end of two years of fear and agony now i shall have peace now i shall sleep i thank god you've come i thank god i can go back harris broke the spell by leaping to his feet he sprang between the two men what does this mean he commanded hemingway raised his eyes and surveyed him steadily it means he said that i have deceived you harris that i am the man you told me of i am the man they want he turned to the officer i fooled him for four months he said i couldn't fool you for five minutes the eyes of the detective danced with sudden excitement joy and triumph he shot an eager glance from hemingway to the consul this man he demanded who is he with an impatient gesture hemingway signified harris he doesn't know who i am he said he knows me as hemingway i am henry brownell of waltham massachusetts again his face sank into the palms of his hands and i'm tired tired he moaned i am sick of not knowing sick of running away i give myself up the detective breathed a sigh of relief that seemed to issue from his soul my god he sighed you've given me a long chase i've had eleven months of you and i'm as sick of this as you are he recovered himself sharply as though reciting an incantation he addressed hemingway in crisp emotionless notes henry brownell he chanted i arrest you in the name of the commonwealth of massachusetts for the robbery on october the eleventh nineteen hundred and nine of the waltham title and trust company i understand he added you waive extradition and return with me of your own free will with his face still in his hands hemingway murmured assent the detective stepped briskly and uninvited to the table and seated himself he was beaming with triumph with pleasurable excitement i want to send a message home mr consul he said may i use your cable blanks harris was still standing in the centre of the room looking down upon the bowed head and shoulders of hemingway since in amazement he had sprung toward him he had not spoken and he was still silent inside the skull of wilbur harris of iowa u s a american consul to zanzibar east africa there was going forward a mighty struggle that was not fit to put into words for harris and his conscience had met and were at odds one way or the other the fight must be settled at once and whatever he decided must be for all time this he understood and as his sympathies and conscience struggled for the mastery the pen of the detective scratching at racing speed across the paper warned him that only a few seconds were left him in which to protest or else to forever after hold his peace so realistic had been the acting of hemingway that for an instant harris himself had been deceived but only for an instant with his knowledge of the circumstances he saw that hemingway was not confessing to a crime of his own but drawing across the trail of the real criminal the convenient and useful red herring he knew that already hemingway had determined to sail the next morning in leaving zanzibar he was making no sacrifice he merely was carrying out his original plan and by taking away with him the detective was giving brownell and his wife at least a month in which to again lose themselves what was his own duty he could not determine 
that of hemingway he knew nothing he could truthfully testify and if now hemingway claimed to be henry brownell he had no certain knowledge to the contrary that through his adventure hemingway would come to harm did not greatly disturb him he foresaw that his wife need only send a wireless from nantucket and at the wharf witnesses would swarm to establish his identity and make it evident the detective had blundered and in the meanwhile brownell and his wife in some settlement still further removed from observation could for the second time have fortified themselves against pursuit and capture he saw the eyes of hemingway fixed upon him in appeal and warning the brisk voice of the detective broke the silence you will testify if need be mr consul he said that you heard the prisoner admit he was henry brownell and that he surrendered himself of his own free will for an instant the consul hesitated then he nodded stiffly i heard him he said three hours later at ten o'clock of the same evening the detective and hemingway leaned together on the rail of the crown prince eitel forward in the glare of her cargo lights to the puffing and creaking of derricks and donkey engines bundles of beeswax of raw hides and precious tusks of ivory were being hurled into the hold from the shore boats clinging to the ship's sides came the shriek of the zanzibar boys from the smoking-room the blare of the steward's band and the clink of glasses those of the youth of zanzibar who were on board the german and english clerks and agents saw in the presence of hemingway only a purpose similar to their own the desire of a homesick exile to gaze upon the mirrored glories of the eitel's saloon at the faces of white men and women to listen to home-made music to drink home-brewed beer as he passed the smoking-room they called to him and to the stranger at his elbow but he only nodded smiling and avoiding them ascended to the shadow of the deserted boat deck are you sure he said you told no one no one the detective answered of course your hotel proprietor knows your sailing but he doesn't know why and by sunrise we'll be well out at sea the words caught hemingway by the throat he turned his eyes to the town lying like a field of snow in the moonlight somewhere on one of its flat roofs a merry dinner-party was laughing drinking perhaps regretting his absence wondering at his excuse of sudden illness she was there and he with the detective like a shadow at his elbow was sailing out of her life for ever he had seen her for the last time that morning for the last time had looked into her eyes had held her hands in his he saw the white beach the white fortress-like walls the hanging gardens the curtsying palms dimly it was among those that he who had thought himself content had found happiness and had then seen it desert him and take out of his life pleasure in all other things with a pain that seemed impossible to support he turned his back upon zanzibar and all it meant to him and as he turned he faced coming towards him across the moonlit deck fearing his instinct was to cry out to the man in warning but his second thought showed him that through his very effort to protect the other he might bring about his undoing so helpless to prevent in agitation and alarm he waited in silence of the two men fearing appeared the least disturbed with a polite but authoritative gesture he turned to the detective 
"'I have something to say to this gentleman before he sails,' he said. "'Would you kindly stand over there?' He pointed across the empty deck at the other rail. In the alert, confident young man in the English mess jacket, clean-shaven and bronzed by the suns of the equator, the detective saw no likeness to the pale, bearded bank clerk of the New England city. This, he guessed, must be some English official, some friend of Brownell's, who generously had come to bid the unfortunate fugitive God speed. Assured of this, the detective bowed politely, and out of hearing, but with his prisoner in full view, took up a position against the rail opposite. Turning his back upon the detective and facing Hemingway with his eyes close to his, fearing began abruptly. His voice was sunk to a whisper, but he spoke without the slightest sign of trepidation, without the hesitation of an instant. Two years ago, when I was indicted,' he whispered, and ran away, Polly laid back half of the sum I stole. That left her without a penny. That's why she took to this typewriting. Since then I have paid back nearly all the rest.' But Polly was not satisfied. She wanted me to take my punishment and start fresh. She knew they were watching her, so she couldn't write this to me. But she came to me by a roundabout way, taking a year to get here. And all the time she's been here, she's been begging me to go back and give myself up. I couldn't see it. I knew in a few months I'd have paid back all I took, and I thought that was enough. I wanted to keep out of jail. But she said I must take my medicine in our own country and start square with a clean slate. She's done a lot for me, and whether I'd have done that for her or not, I do not know. But now I must. What you did tonight to save me leaves me no choice. So I'll sail. With an exclamation of anger, Hemingway caught the other by the shoulder and dragged him closer. To save you, he whispered. No one's thinking of you. I didn't do it for you. I did it that you both could escape together to give you time. But I tell you, protested Fearing, she doesn't want me to escape. And maybe she's right. Anyway, we're sailing with you at... We echoed Hemingway, that again he was to see the woman he loved, that for six weeks through summer seas he would travel in her company, filled him with alarm, with distress, with a wonderful happiness. We oui, he whispered, steadying his voice, then your wife is going with you. Fearing gazed at him as though the other had suddenly gone mad. "'My wife!' he exclaimed. "'I haven't got a wife. If you mean Polly, Mrs. Adair, she's my sister. And she wants to thank you. She's below—' He was not allowed to finish. Hemingway had flung him to one side and was racing down the deck. The detective sprang in pursuit. "'One moment there!' he shouted. But the man in the white mess jacket barred his way. In the moonlight the detective saw that the alert, bronzed young man was smiling. "'That's all right,' said Fearing. "'He'll be back in a minute. Besides, you don't want him. I'm the man you want.'" End of Part 3 End of The Men of Zanzibar by Richard Harding Davis Recorded by Carolyn in Groningen in the Netherlands in August 2015. Thank you for listening.